you know, we were sophomores in college. I was on a college sophomore's budget. Um, so I think Olive Garden had a special going on, like two for 17 and two for 15, something like that. All you can eat salad and breadsticks. So, you know, we went there, filled up on salad and breadsticks and got two entree. I even think it may have been come with two desserts too. <laughs> and that was how, that was our, that was our first date. So we showed up at ESPN Zone. I showed up just casual. I'm very big on, you know, this is who I am. So I didn't have any makeup on. I just, this is Roxy, right? Take me as I am or don't. And Armand showed up in like a full blown suit and was trying to impress. And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, and so we went, we had a great time. We played air hockey, which I won. No, oh, no, 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 because if you had won, we wouldn't be here. We played air hockey. She was, she, if, in playing air hockey, she was like, if you want a second date, you're going to have to play me in air hockey and beat me. <laughs> oh, see, it wasn't that bad. No, 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 no. Okay, no, no, no. And then she's like, you know, back home and, you know, in the Bay. <laughs> the all my people know me as like a legend on air hockey. Yes, I've, I've, I love I, air hockey. Like, I've smoked everybody. So, you know. <laughs> Good luck to you. And I'm kind of like, okay, so look. <laughs> I've already asked this girl for her phone number. She said, no, she's going to Paris. <laughs> and, you, and now, you, you know, you've mentioned to your boys you're going on a date with somebody. And when the another boy, oh, so whatever happened to so-and-so you were trying to holler at. However this story is going to play out, the narrative will not be, and I lost to her in air hockey and I needed a second date. <laughs> so I took my suit jacket off, rolled up my sleeves, and I was like, I might not get another date, but this girl's about to get smoked. <laughs> <laughs> he won, we ate, and we had a good time. I can say growing up here in this area, I'm from here, growing up here at Daly, growing around a lot more African-Americans um, in Prince George's County, going to public school system. So at Daly, just being used to that and, you know, my family and just how we were raised and as far as, you know, beliefs and, you know, being a Baptist in the church and growing up into that and I just feed off of that, you know, that's a lot of things that I carried on. So my parents who are still married, you know, I kind of like to idolize them at times and, you know, see what they've done to still be successfully married. You know, I'm 29, they have 31, 30 years of marriage to, to them. So try to see what they've done, being in that household, seeing the ups and downs, like knowing marriage, you know, isn't always on the high, it's, it has downs and, you know, seeing how the work, the thing. So just being in that household was just, something I got the model from, you know, ideally. So I'll let her speak for her instance. Him going to North Carolina A&T, I went to um, Harris Stone State University in St. Louis. Um, and so just us being able to relate on that level and then wanting that for our daughter and future children, like, okay, I know that's one thing we're gonna try to instill in them. Like you have to, look, you have to go to some type of HBCU. I don't care where it is, but you have to go to one. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but having that experience and being able to like pass it down. So yeah, and that was one of our main things that like attracted each other. Like we was just, I mean, I guess we were reliving that, reliving those days of of college and the fun that we had. So I I think the way I grew up was um, like we we were the family that had that same Martin Luther King picture on the wall and but everybody right everybody right, had that right, right, right. but I went to majority white school when I was younger um but I my parents all we always I always knew we were black we always did our household was black you know you watch the Jeffersons you do all you know you do all the black you eat collard greens on Sunday we still had a black family it didn't matter where we lived we were still black so when right. even when I would go to element they would have you know where you would have days that you would share I'm bringing in a cool and a gang um, album to school and my, I'm the only black there's two black people in my entire class 
you know, when they are having, um, when they're having the, uh, what is it, the slavery talk, everybody's looking at me <laughs> at class, and I'm looking at, I was like, yeah. I wasn't there, so I'm not, <laughs> can't really add anything to it. You know, right, I always right. just had to hold myself as, this is me, I am this person, so when we got older, it just kind of transformed as, I'm black, and I'm gonna, you know, everything is about being black, regardless of what's going on around you, you're still black. You know, you can be black, and my parents always used to say, it doesn't, we did everything. You know, there's black sports and whites. We didn't, my parents didn't do that. You're black, but you play tennis. You black, but you go swimming. Yes, you go <clears throat> swimming, your hair can get wet. Like, those types of things, I, my parents shaped me that way, that I was always black, but you just do whatever you feel like you mm -hmm. like to do. Mm -hmm. So for us, then you still, we, when we got married, it was like, well, we're going, trying to support people, but we were still, we knew that it was proper, you know, everybody doesn't get a chance. You go to small businesses and we might as well just use all black businesses. The more that we have been together, and especially since we've had children, um, I have really gotten to understand that I, I am more in touch with my blackness than I thought, and I like it, which is good. And then, um, well, I mean, hey, not everybody does, which is terrible, but true. Uh, <laughs> but um, especially like with the way the racial climate in our country shifted, I was like, okay, so this is the time for me to really solidify what I think what I feel, um, take the opportunity, because being married to a white guy means I have an ally <laughs> with some privilege. And so then it was like, well, now I feel like I have the responsibility to kind of educate him so that he can be as useful as possible to making you know, the world better for us and our kids. And um, it made me a lot more like, not self-conscious, but like culturally conscious. Look, there, like you said, there's a stereotype and there's a narrative, right? Yeah. And that narrative, the, the narrative that there are healthy black families who are trying to raise their children, who are productive citizens, who are proud to be Americans, but we have our own version of what America needs to be and what it needs to strive to be. That narrative isn't popular. And so, you know, it's, it's not gonna be out there. And I think that's the reason why we have to tell our own stories yeah. we, and, we, and we have to communicate our own truth. Yeah. Um, and then beyond that, to me, I'm kind of like, to me in terms of, you know, educated black men, I'm like this, if, I mean, I'm a political science major. Politics is, a, is about life. And so I knew when I was going to undergrad that there were some brothers who were like, well, I want something other than a black woman. And I viewed that as, well, that's a political choice. If I get to X place in life and you see me with somebody else in my arm, for me personally, is like it becomes hard to sell a narrative of, I want this for black folks. And then in terms of what I wanted intimately in my personal life, I chose something else. For me, I was like, I love black people. As a consequence, I love black women. As a consequence, I want a black woman on my arm. Because politics is personal. Um, and that's not a knock against anybody else. Every human being has a right to make their own, have their own right to self-determination. And I support that 100%. Just for what was right for me was the I wanted somebody who could understand me, who could believe in me, and understood my culture and appreciated it and valued it because it was hers as well. We've always loved each other, even as friends. Um, I mean, that's just the truth. We, we have. Um, but as far as a relationship, I think it's once we really got to know each other, like actually spending time with each other, like he decided no more friends, let's do what we need to do. But sometimes he gets amnesia and doesn't remember that he said that to me, but he did. I knew I love her because I'm not the same person I was before. So when my actions starting to change, it wasn't a feeling um, like, oh, man, I'm in love with her. It was throughout the years knowing, changing things in your life and going, and, to not um, hurt your wife, you know, as far as putting yourself in predicaments that, you know, that a see or crowd. And I always tell her that I say, it's 
you could be older and you could be a man, but when you stop putting yourself in, in predicaments that are, allow you to lose your family and, you know, if you ever seen your wife cry and you don't want to do nothing to see that hurt, you know, that shame, you know, um, so far as like going out, you know, to different clubs again or, or you know, f real flirtations or probably think you slick or sometimes, you know, uh, when I start seeing myself change in those aspects, you know, and that's when I knew the love was there. The number one thing that I loved was that I can be my natural self around him. You know, from day one, you know how a lot of times when you start dating, you give you a representative, you know, and we both have you know, I believe that we both have been led to by God to be, you know, with each other and previous relationships that we've been in. I think God kind of prepared us to be in this type of relationship now. So I say that to say that I did not have to keep my guard up, even though I wanted to. You know, when we first started dating, I didn't have to. And that I appreciated because I can be Tiffany, you know, at all times. Another thing that I was very proud of is that he he has raised his two children um, for what eleven years alone, and um, that to me that's that shows a lot of strength and leadership and something that is rare. And I I was glad to be welcomed into his family and accepted up by you know his children. And I I'm just I just appreciate that the much as sorry, how much he loves um, in general. So that's what makes me, you know, remain close to him and, and makes me appreciate him a lot because he, he's, he's just like the best kind of guy. I knew that I loved him once I saw, I knew I loved him once I saw him with his son, you know what I mean? And to me that I just, I don't know, I just, I could tell that he loved his son like nobody else in the world, you know what I mean? And that, to me, that was important, you know what I mean? And he took on my two children, you know, as his own, and then now we have one together, so, you know, I just, I love, he's just a great father, and that's probably one of the, the most reasons that I love him the most. The fact that he can um, display his love is, um, is very admirable that he doesn't, he, he's fine with wearing everything up on his sleeves. You know, he's just um, open with himself. And when we're talking about even with business, he'll sit up there and uh, tell people the way he talks about, when I hear him talk about me and my business, mm -hmm. it just makes me, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just, you know, a real sweet situation because it's like, for us, we have been together, like, we've been married 22 years, but we've been together 25, 26, 28, 20, 28 years. Yeah, dated six oh, years. Oh, right? boy. 28 years. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, it's like almost half our lives have been together, mm -hmm. and but we still are these kids. We are still, you know, dating every day. We're mm -hmm. still having fun. I remember our cousin, my cousin asked me one day, she was getting married, she was like, how do you all keep, you know, keep, loving each other and I was like still hold his hand it doesn't matter like if you love him you should still be able to profess your love regardless it doesn't stop just because you know it's year 15 or it's year five or it's year eight mm -hmm. um, you still are going to you know you still love him still do things that make you show that you love him and I think that that's what the big thing about um, us is that you know he, he makes me love him all the time it doesn't matter. Um, my first thought when I saw him was, um, I thought it was, I mean, he wasn't really my type only because I could tell like the, the background differences, you know what I mean? So I knew he was kind of like a, a street dude, I guess you could say, you know what I mean? So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, my first thoughts was, you know, I was like, probably the same way as she is, you know, 
no edge, you know, she a little, you know, a little nerdy to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, we're total, I mean, it was, it was apparent that we were like total opposites. Like if we had met, like, if it wasn't, like if it weren't like set up, then we probably would have never approached each other or crossed paths. It was pretty obvious of that, so. I received a note in the mail saying, um, yeah, X amount of days to pay this and you had to go to court, you know, what have you. So I'm freaking out instantly, like I just told you, court to me equals jail. And in her job, she goes to court a lot. So, you know, pertaining to different things. So she's calm, cool, collected. And I'm like, yo, I, I need to go, I need to go. <laughs> so I take off work, she meets up with me, but she takes off of work. I didn't expect her to do it, but you know, uh, she meets up with me. I'm like, okay, can you take, I'm gonna drop my call. Can you drop me off? And I just go from there. She's like, no, I'm gonna go with you the whole nine and make sure you're good. And I tell this story and I always tell people she had my back when I thought I was going to jail. And that's what made me know that she was down, you know, and it didn't take long or much from that. And I'm forever grateful, even though it just blew in the water. But to me, that was a big deal. That didn't indicate that I knew that she was the one to marry, but it did indicate that I knew I needed her in my life. And she was very special. I proposed when we were right out of high school. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, so I prefaced that because I had no money. So there wasn't a whole lot of big rings and right. nothing to that effect. So we were in line um, at Chesa Chesapeake. What was the name of the restaurant? Chesapeake Bay restaurant. For all you old head people in the DMV, y'all know, yeah. Chesapeake Bay was a restaurant, a seafood restaurant. All you can eat. It was delicious. Right. It was wonderful. So we were going there thinking we were doing something. Right, right. So again, we had no money. We were right out of high school. I think it was like our first year of college. Um, so we were in line because it was a line to get in. And I had written a letter. And in the letter, I talked about I professed my love to her and how I want to spend the rest of my life with her. And I gave her that letter, figured we were in line, you know, um, and I'm always trying to embarrass her, right? So I'm always trying to make her laugh and be silly like I am. So I figured what, what better time than while we stand in line. So I gave her the letter and I said, just read this. Tell me what you think about it. So she read it. And at the end of the letter, it said, if you would, you know, do me the honor and be my wife, I really would, you know, would love that. So, and so put your hand out when you finish reading the letter. And she read the letter and she put her hand out and I put the ring on. Valentine's Day, he said, okay, babe, let's, we love crabs. We'll eat them all year long. Just come over to my house. We're gonna eat crabs, relax. It was snowing outside. That's relaxing to me. And he said, you know, the day after Valentine's Day, after church, I'm gonna take you somewhere special. So in my mind, I'm like, you better take me somewhere special because Valentine's Day, I'm sitting inside and even though that's great, but you know, that's- Where the fire <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we go to church and then after church. First of all, first of all, she was mad. On okay. Valentine's. Yes. You think so? Because I know so, I know you. She was mad and I, because I, I didn't get any flowers, like I kept it straight basic, like oh, straight yeah. crabs. You didn't even do the flowers. No, flowers. no yeah. flowers, no candy, no nothing. Now so, you're doing this as an oversight? Or I, no, doing I'm doing this on purpose. Oh, so you like and I'm talking about <laughs> like, we're sitting there eating, watching TV and she just has this like look on her face. And it was several times where like literally I walked downstairs to laugh. <laughs> literally like wanted to die laughing um so uh sunday was sunday was church it was snowing i told her uh, i said i'm gonna take you somewhere special after at the church so we get to church um then after church uh get her in the car put a blindfold on her um and so what i had planned was i had told both of our families and our closest friends i had gathered them in some like a similar place like this uh, and I was gonna propose in front of all of our friends and family. Right. Um, so put her in the car. She had no idea where we were going. She's sitting there with a blindfold on. Drive her to, uh, drive her to the place. 
um, get there. Uh, her most majority of her side of the family is there. And her friends is there and they've already set up, got the food and everything out. Uh, my family's like trickling in from church. Um, so I had the, I had her like sit in a waiting room and just wait, say, okay, babe, like they not ready yet. It's not open yet. Like just, so she's literally just sitting there with a blindfold on her head. People are tiptoeing past her. So they don't, they don't wake her up. I mean, they don't, you know, she can't hear them. So I get her, walk her in. I take the blindfold off. All, like all of our friends and family had to be like 75, 200 people there. I um, was like, surprise, do you know what the first thing she said to me was? Babe, are my eyebrows okay? <laughs> because I used to draw them, you know, like fill them in all the time and that was my main concern. Because I have all these people looking at me right now. She literally said, are my eyebrows okay? So you're thinking this is about to be my moment. I can't just be looking crazy. Exactly. How do my eyebrows look? Yes. And so I did it, I, I proposed to her right there. Um, right there in front of all our friends, families. Um, she said yes, and then we just had a, you know, we had a huge engagement party right then and there. The only woman in this world that I think who could, de who could deal with me, could understand what I'm going through in this world and, and what I have to accomplish would be, a, it has to be a sister. And, and why for, is that? Um, because it's, it's shared experience. Yeah. Um, it's because there's some things I don't have to communicate. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. It's like, the, you know, the brother's head nod. If you were an African-American male, I couldn't tell you what it is that I walk down the street, I see you, you see me, and we both nod. Because to some people, we're absolutely invisible. And I don't know where I learned it or what time it, but it's, it's natural and it's normal. It's, I could sit and talk to Roxy about, man, we were cracking up in the barbershop tonight. And it's the, and we, we live in the same world. We have the same cultural history. We, we're, we exist in the same space. And I don't have to translate my blackness to her in a way that she can understand. And it's the... And it's, and it's the, I'm, I'm, I'm unapologetically black. I don't want to be something else. I love what I am. I love where I, where I come from. I love, you know, my family. I love, I love that I got my DNA tested and I know where my people in Africa come from. Like, I mean, I'm, you know, blackity black, black, obsidian black. So it's a, and I don't, and I don't want to have to, and, and, and it's not a knock against anybody else. I think every human being has the right to choose love and how they find it and what works right for them. But for me personally, it was like, I knew that I wanted a sister. Um, but having gone to two HBCUs, I knew there were a lot of educated black women out there. Um, and I wanted somebody who was on my level, who wanted to work hard, who had a good heart. And, you know, and I found you and you had, you had really nice hair. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted somebody that I could be able to, I, how do you teach black boys or black girls and how to be loved and see love and show love? And I think the best way is by a loving black household that can translate history and ancestry and passion and strength uh, right. into these kids and, and show them that. Um, and I just, I just couldn't imagine being married to anyone other than a black man. <laughs>